All right, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today um, at our third Lunch and Learn. Today we are going to have two speakers and before then kind of give an introduction to what we have been doing over at the ARC of PA and how this Lunch and Learn series has kind of come to be. So the ARC of Pennsylvania received a grant from the Pennsylvania Department of Health to address COVID-19 health disparities among people with disabilities. Um, so we really developed a robust um, kind of method of collecting all of this data and releasing reports. So there are two reports that have been released, the COVID-19 healthcare barriers among people with disabilities, as well as the recommendations report. So recommendations for addressing COVID-19 health disparities among the disability community. The setup for this um, report or the, the setup for this project included a COVID-19 health disparities task force. And this task force was compromised of a lot of different stakeholders across the state, including um, disability reps, healthcare reps, people um, from the Nurses Association and the Hospital Association. We also had something called regional community work groups, which included over 400 people across the state with varying perspectives. There were individuals with lived experience of disability, their family members and caretakers, as well as health professionals, and um, including intentional outreach to racial and ethnic minority groups and rural populations as well. We of course had our ARC of PA admin team and our local chapters participate. And of course, this could not be possible without that funding from the PA de um, Pennsylvania Department of Health. So today's focus, um, our recommendations report had 10 core recommendations, and today we're going to focus on the recommendations surrounding accessible health care and alternative health care delivery. So these include increasing accessibility features of health care facilities, expanding community-based health care, including telehealth services or mobile health clinics, and as well as a little bit of information that was presented in an earlier lunch and learn about accessible healthcare information. So today's agenda, we are going to first quickly go through that health disparity report and recommendations that we that I just spoke about, those 10 core recommendations before getting into our practice panel today and then entering into a Q&A at the end. So this is the um, recommendations report and the barriers report that we released. It is, I believe, was just put into the chat in case anyone is interested in taking a full look at all of that. It's really comprehensive and both of those reports go really into depth on the work that we've been doing the past two years. So again, during that listening tour, we spoke to over 400 individuals to gather all of this data. There was diversity by role, so that lived experience, caretakers and family members, professionals in the field of disability and healthcare. We had intentional outreach to all disability types, intentional outreach to um, all racial and ethnic minority groups, as well as location. So making sure we spoke to individuals in rural settings, urban and suburban, but that intentional outreach to more rural settings since they had some compounded barriers. So this is how we arranged our barriers findings by something called social determinants of health. And social determinants of health are um, factors from where you work, play, live, learn, or worship that influence your health in some way, shape, or form. Um, so this is how it was kind of organized in our report. We went by education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, neighborhood and built environment, economic stability, and social and community context. Um, today, we are kind of identifying some of those information barriers as well as some systemic healthcare barriers. And we're gonna talk about some um, practical applications that have already been put into place in our state to kind of remedy these. One of the quotes in, in our report is this whole thing made it difficult for people with disability to be self-sufficient. It's like climbing a ladder. The further you go, the further up you go away from the familiar, the scarier it is and the more alone you feel. 
And we are also going to click on a short video right now from one of our uh, listening to our participants who is embedded in our report. Her name is Kelly Barrett. She is a person with a physical disability living in Erie County. And this video is really short. There's about 10 of them embedded throughout the report if anyone's interested in taking a look at all of them. Give us one moment to get that video pulled up. For example, I've been some places where they have a Hoyer lift available, but when you get there, even though you've told them that you need it beforehand, um, when you get there, they have to go find it because they may only have one or two. Um, and then in addition to that, when they go find it, they have to go find the people that know how to operate it. So, you know, <laughs> it just gets to be a little silly when you, um, but your needs, you know, you let them know your needs ahead of time, but then the the uh, staff themselves don't know how to meet those needs. Thanks, Kathy, for pulling that up. We're going to put up the slides really quickly and go over a few more things before diving into our practice panel. Um, but that was just one example of those stories that we included in our report. Another one is from Jeffrey Denenson, who is a person with a mental health condition living in Butler County. And he said, telehealth worked for me. I know I'm getting cut off. I know it's difficult to, oh, sorry, Kathy. I know it's difficult to help you make an egg over make an appointment over the phone, but you can talk about how your day went. All right, so diving into the recommendation that we're going to focus on today, it includes um, increased accessibility features of healthcare facilities and medical equipment to ensure full and equal access for people with disabilities. So some examples that we included in our report include height adjustable exam tables, weight scales that accommodate wheelchairs, accessible check-in kiosks, lift equipment to transfer patients, sign language interpreters available, and sensory friendly waiting rooms. The other recommendation is an expand the community-based healthcare program in the Department of Health to include both of the expansion and protection of accessible health telehealth services, as well as the development of accessible mobile health care clinics. So some benefits from these are increased accessibility and flexibility in health care delivery. It eliminates the need for transportation and facility physical accessibility barriers, as well as allowing persons to remain in a familiar place and comfortable surroundings, such as their home um, or another facility that which they reside in. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy Rocha Meyer to bring us through a couple of resources and practices that we see um, being done across the state and being done across the nation. Thank you, Emma, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathy Rocha Meyer with the Ark of Pennsylvania, and this is a picture, very recent picture of myself and my son Pierce, who happens to be on the autism spectrum. And we, of course, have had lots of experience with healthcare services and making sure that it meets his needs. So this topic is, is very important to us. And so I will be sharing some resources, starting with a few resources from the um, Center for Medicaid and Medicare. The first one is how to improve physical accessibility for your healthcare facility. And we also have another one from that organization, Modernizing Healthcare to Improve Physical Accessibility. Both different guides go through very specific ideas and concepts and checklists so that your organization and healthcare provider can look at how they're physically setting up their equipment, their access, so that you can really dive into it. 
We also have a few other um, resources such as this one, which says Rehearsal Guide for Dental Visits from KEPRO, one of the HICU's healthcare quality units, which has this one particular for dental visits, but they have a whole list of other type of rehearsal guides which are similar to social stories that really prepare the individual what to expect, what so they can really understand what's going to happen and participate in their health care and make them comfortable. And lastly, we have another resource from STEM Punks, a guide to the neurodiverse healthcare access. This is issue two. And one of the things that goes over is the model of space, sensory, predictability, acceptance, communication, and empathy, this framework. And it applies it to healthcare set settings, including in the domains of physical processing and emotional. It also has other articles on healthcare access and other methods that you can look at, but this guide really looks at all areas of healthcare, uses charts to help you understand and see what you might be able to adapt. Next, we're moving on to some resources for our telehealth. And our first one is from the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Center, the NCTRC, recommendations for providers. It's a tip sheet to give very specific information on looking at their platforms, accessibility modes, the way they communicate, how it works with assistive technology. We then have a resource from telehealth for children with special needs, which gives tips for working with families. It's very person centered and it really includes the whole family and how to make sure that the telehealth visits are functional and accessible to all. We then have from the National Association of the Deaf accessibility requirements for interpreting telehealth from the guidelines for healthcare providers for video-based telehealth accessibility for deaf and hard of hearing patients. Another extensive guide to give very specific ideas and concepts so that they can make sure it's accessible to this population. And lastly, going back to the NCTRC, part of their webinar series, which are hacks, um, series. It's a 38 minute video, which is going to go over all ways that we can build accessible telehealth for patients with disabilities from the ground up. Next, we'll move into some resources for telehealth. This, I'm sorry, mobile healthcare. First one is promising practices for increasing access to transportation in rural communities from the Walsh Center and Rural Health Analysis covers a lot of information in rural areas, but this is applicable in other areas as well. It gives you ideas on how to make access uh, possible for transportation, which is a major hurdle that we hear both in rural areas for access as well as urban and other settings for our individuals with disabilities. And it has a large section on mobile healthcare and how to establish and make it accessible. Next. We have from the University of Penn, Penn Dental, which you'll hear from today, the mobile dentistry webinar. It goes over telehealth practices, alternative non-traditional care settings, and your equipment, your settings for people with disabilities. It's very extensive. You do need to register with your email to access the webinar but it's still free. And they also have a host of other webinars working with people with disabilities in these settings. Next, we have the mobile um, reach from the AJ Drexel Autism Institute, which stands for Resources and Education for Autism and Community Health. It focuses on autism spectrum disorder, and it's a tool designed to provide assessments and help people learn about the Autism Institute and resources it has done evaluations during the pandemic. It provided vaccines and has had many other uses. Lastly, from Harvard Medical School, we have a mobile clinic app search where you can go on. We have a little picture here of the Pittsburgh area, but it will pull up the entire state of Pennsylvania and show you where you can find mobile health clinics, but you can also register your clinic there as well. So the network could be more solid. 
Lastly, we also did have another session on access and plain language, but we wanted to include two additional resources here. Uh, the first one is from the Autistic Self Advocacy Network, ASAN, One Idea Per Line, A Guide to Making Easy Read Resources. It includes plain language and easy read. It explains the difference and also shares different concepts and ideas to make sure that the materials and how you're explaining things to patients can be used and adapted. Lastly, we have communicating with people with disabilities. And this is getting started communicating with the National League for Nursing. It's an extensive guide uh, with digital documents, forms, presentations, media, and understanding universal design for um, really healthcare and how we can really communicate and get the best outcomes for our people with disabilities. Uh, you will get a copy of a link if it's not in there already of all these resources that I hope you get a chance to peruse. Now we're going to move to our practice panel, getting to see it in real life and all the exciting things that are happening. We're going to start with Station MD with Dr. Malik Trevetti from the, he is from the Chief Strategy Officer from Station MD. And then we'll move to Penn Dental Medicine's Personalized Care Suite for Persons with Disability P Care with Dr. Alicia Reisner Bauman. Uh, who is the Associate Director for Pen Care Center for Persons with Disabilities. Uh, just so you're aware, you will get copies of the PowerPoint and all the materials after the session. And you will also um, be have the opportunity to take questions after both of our presenters have concluded. So with that said, we're looking forward to hearing your wonderful presentation. And I invite Dr. Trevetti to open his and share his presentation and begin. Cool. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Malik Trevetti, and I'm one of the uh, co-founders of Physicians with Station MD, and uh, just was asked to kind of go over real quickly what we do as a solution, as a service. Um, very informal. Please interrupt me if you have any questions. And for those of you who may have seen this before, I apologize, uh, but just wanted to kind of give you an overview of our telehealth platform, what we do and why we think it's impactful, and then uh, just some updates. Uh, but uh, I do really believe this is a game changer for the disability community. And um, in a nutshell, uh, our mission at Station MD is pretty straightforward, and that's just to elevate the quality of health care for individuals with IDD. We happen to use telehealth to deliver that care, and we are providing this care to, oh, uh, Jeff, correct me, well over 1,200 people or so in Pennsylvania, or maybe more. Really That's correct. Yeah, approaching 1,500 currently. Yep. 1,500. Yeah. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, my name is Malik Trevetti. I'm one of the co-founders, emergency medicine physician by training, and we founded the organization with several other physicians with a focus only on this population. Uh, the only population we treat is individuals with IDD. We started with about 40 people in New York, and now we are in 22 states covering close to 40,000 lives. Um, we, <clears throat> important to emphasize is that we are all, uh, all our clinicians are carefully vetted by us and, and, um, but also go through a specialized curriculum and training to understand not just the clinical needs and nuances of this population, but also the non-clinical needs of what provider agencies need and do. And, and I think it's fair to say, I feel comfortable saying it, most physicians don't really understand this population, not just clinically, but also non-clinically. I don't think most doctors would know what a DSP is or the uh, special um, kind of ecosystem that uh, the provider agencies and human service organizations live in. Uh, next slide. We are members of many of these organizations, speak at many of them in PA and out, outside of PA. One of our missions is also to just get the word out about improving the care of this population. So um, just want to kind of really emphasize that we are advocates for this uh, group of individuals. Next slide. So, you know, why does this population use the ER uh, or an urgent care more frequently? And again, probably preaching to the choir here, but, you know, outside of the individuals underlying IDD, they have comorbidities, they are complex, um, whether it's behavioral, whether it's uh, uh, GI, whether it, it's, it's pulmonary or, or anything like that. Um, they, they are complex and, and 
even if they have a primary care physician, it's not often that that physician's always available, can answer their question. Uh, if you have one that really understands your needs and whatnot, great, but that's not the case, what we have seen. And by default, individuals tend to get sent to the ER or urgent care because that's their only recourse for their, um, for their needs. Um, it, I also put in here regular re regulatory requirements. Oftentimes there are regulations that this population faces that um, these are well-intentioned regulations that are placed on agencies uh, that have unintended consequences where if something transpires, you have to see a doctor. Um, and we kind of tick that box. You know, we are there uh, as a resource 24 seven for the individuals and the agency. Uh, our goal is to ultimately treat that individual in the least disruptive, most stable environment, and that is their home setting. Uh, next slide. So, you know, uh, this is a screenshot of an ER. I mean, it's traumatic for anyone, but you can imagine for someone with IDD, it's especially traumatic and it's frightening. Um, it's disruptive. Uh, and again, our, our goal is to treat people in their home setting. And what we found is, is that oftentimes something that takes seven, eight hours to handle the ER, we can handle in 20 minutes. And, and really that is our goal. Uh, next slide. You have this combination then with the ER of really unspecialized care. It's disruptive, uh, obviously traumatic to the individual, and then also adds up. It's extremely expensive. These are uh, hospitalizations that uh, are, are unnecessary many times. A lot of times individuals will arrive in the ER and get over-tested because of a lot of what I said, the physician's busy. Um, they don't really understand the needs of this population. <clears throat> they get over-tested and then by default, they get admitted because they they don't really know what to do. And, and that is obviously not necessarily in the case in, in many of these issues. Next slide. So, you know, switching gears to telehealth, um, I, you know, I, I would argue that uh, the value of telehealth is if there is any silver lining to the pandemic, uh, it's even greater for this population. Um, a lot of because of what I've said, just getting to a specialized clinician is very really tough. Transportation is challenging. Um, and, and the population that we treat, oftentimes, once they leave home, um, they decompensate or it's challenging. And, and of course, staffing is, is a massive issue. So just getting someone out to a facility or urgent care, ER, doctor's office, you have to backfill their their you know position in their home. Uh, we worked with some group homes in the past where if one individual would go to the ER, everyone would go uh, because they were just so short staffed. So uh, I do think there is extreme value in having a specialized telehealth service for this population. Next slide. So you know, how, how does this work? Uh, access, uh, left is a problem, the right solution. So lack of access, there are no geographic impediments to you know, telehealth. As long as we have a Wi-Fi signal or a cell signal, you know, we can provide those services. Um, the suboptimal care, like I mentioned, um, you're connecting with clinicians who are specially trained. We have our own medical record that we've developed, uh, EHR, so to speak. Um, where everybody's information is there. It's not like a blind evaluation or looking, sifting through a big binder. Um, we are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we provide full documentation of all of our encounters to the primary care doc or whatever care team is authorized to uh, look at those. Next slide. So I do want to emphasize that, you know, this is a resource for DSPs and families. It doesn't have to be an emergent call. We do med refills. We answer questions. You know, in this <clears throat> population, constipation, if it's not addressed, turns into bowel obstruction. Um, UTI turns into urosepsis. So we, we want to be called early. And, and I just think it's been a really welcome resource for uh, DSPs to contact us if they need us for any issue that, that may arise. Next slide. This is just a screenshot of that portal that we use. We call Station Connect. Um, you know, who called, when they called, the doctor's notes, uh, what was the outcome? All of it's just, all of this is in there. It will be available to provider agencies. Uh, it's it's just a, a password access, and um, it's obviously all HIPAA compliant. Next slide. So lastly, just these are some outcomes. Um, this has been very consistent through the life of our company, and uh, this is a 93%, meaning over 9 out of 10 times if we get called, we can keep that individual. And we don't need to send them to uh, urgent care ER. 
and the next slide shows you some of the common reasons we get called. Um, probably all familiar to you, but cough and constipation and COVID, falls, UTI, rash. <clears throat> the light blue, meaning the majority of these, we are able to address and avoid any ED visits or uh, basically treat in place. The dark blue, like for example, with uh, abdominal pain or whatnot. Anytime we send someone out to the ER, I will add that we will also call them in advance and let them know that you're coming and why you're coming. It does expedite the care. It, it also, in my opinion, really um, it alleviates that ER doc from overordering uh, and also allows them to send them back into the uh, community because they know someone's going to follow up on it. Uh, next slide. I have to just another version of that. Let me go. Uh, we did do satisfaction reports, um, work with a company that specializes in um, getting surveys for individuals with IDD, and they were overwhelmingly happy. Um, DSPs and caregivers also felt that increased their job satisfaction and, and um, retention. Next slide. Uh, this was actually an agency that we work with in PA that, um, and they found that after paying for our services, there was an ROI because of uh, avoided visits, decreased staffing costs. Um, you know, <clears throat> you can imagine the payer side's even bigger because we're avoiding ED visits and hospitalizations, but from a provider agency, they also felt uh, there was a return. And I think the next slide is just another agency in New York that had the same, and we can share these slides with you. Um, I believe that's it. This, this uh, last is just a screenshot of a QR code. You can take a picture. It, I think it goes to a video on our website, but you can also just check out our website. <clears throat> there's information there. I think there's a video that shows how it works, but um, that essentially is the, the the process and the solution. But happy to answer any questions or discuss anything further if you, if you need it. Thank you so much. So I do realize you're not going to be with us the whole time. So we'd like to just open it up for questions for you guys right now. Um, we invite any one of our participants to drop your questions in the chat, or you can raise your hand or go off mute. We'll just give it a pause for a few moments and see if we have any additional, any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will say just Great information. Oh, no, thanks. I, I will say, you know, in closing, regardless if it's station MD or not, I, I do really believe that, um, you know, for many, many issues, there's no reason that an individual should be going to the ER urgent care for simple refill or cough. Um, it, it is something that the general population has access to. And I just think it needs to be tweaked a little bit so we can provide our community with the similar. So, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Certainly something we've heard from our participants. And I do see we have a hand up for a question. Our Warman, please go ahead. Rose, Hello. sorry. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you for the information. I do have a question for you, doctor. Yeah. Um, at our agency, the majority of ER visits are all, almost always driven by falls and um, hitting a head uh, from the neck up. We're really cautious about sending people to the ER um, in those cases. How would station MD, but then we end up going to the ER, nothing's found and everything's clear. And, you know, there's quite an expense with CT scans, et cetera. For, for, for falls and injuries to the heads, how do you process that in station sure. MD? Thank you. Yeah, uh, obviously very common issue that we see with falls. And, um, uh, you know, it is not an uncommon reason that we get called. Uh, I'll answer that question uh, in, in in two ways. One, first and foremost, if the clinician feels they need to go to the ER, we we send them to the ER. If the visit that we do virtually isn't as good as or better than an in person visit, then we don't do it. Um, so first, we you know we rely on the clinician's judgment. Now, <clears throat> not everyone that falls and hits their head needs to get a CAT scan. As you probably know, I would venture to guess the majority of those people come back to you and there's nothing found and they're fine. So there's ways to do that. Um, I'll go one extreme. If someone falls and hits their head and they're on a blood thinner, a Coumadin or something, they need a CAT scan. They need to go and get checked out. But if someone falls and hits their head, uh, it was witnessed, <clears throat> they're at their baseline, there's no loss of consciousness, we monitor them. We'll call back in an hour. We'll call back in two hours. We will see, you know, we have to look at the mechanism. Uh, 
we'll do neuro checks. The, the majority of these individuals are fine. You know that, I know that, uh, the staff knows that, but God forbid you're wrong. The first thing they're going to say is, you know, did the doctor see and evaluate that person? So um, it, many of these can be kept safely as long as we follow certain protocols, like checking in on them and, and just relying on clinical uh, judgment. A fall that's witnessed with no loss of consciousness, uh, no bleeding, no other anticoagulants, uh, person's at their baseline, and then we do several follow-ups later, you know, in the course of the next several hours, they're they're totally fine. They don't need to be sent to the ER. So I hope that kind of addresses the, the question. It did. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. And I see we have another question here from Kayla Palmar. Hi. Uh, yes. My question is, um, it's probably on your website, which I'm going to check shortly after um, this time. Um, I just want to confirm that the uh, station MD services are both and or waiver funded um, and accept insurance. Um, yeah. So great question. And we are in the process of getting on the waiver in Pennsylvania. We are not yet. So right now, um, it is funded by agency that, that pay for our services. Um, and we do try to bill uh, insurance and Medicaid if we can. They don't always pay us, um, but we never do any copay or bill the individual. So right now, um, agencies just pay us a, a monthly rate for the number of individuals they want covered. <clears throat> but hopefully, uh, we are close to being a waiver service in PA and love to come back and talk about that when that happens hopefully like in march or so something like that great thanks thank you thank you for your great questions i'm just gonna pause one more moment i haven't seen any others but feel okay. free to go off mute i do think ah dr reisner bauman it looks like you have a hand up yeah, I, I sent it in the chat. For some reason, I can't find my little raised hand guy that puts it up. I, 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 I don't know. Zoom and I aren't always friends. Um, I, just curious how often you get calls regarding uh, oral pain or dental problems, and how do you generally handle those? Yeah, uh, we get them uh, for sure. And then, as you probably know, you know, I mean, oral issues are a big issue in this population. I'll say it in this way. We get calls for issues and we end up finding out it's a dental problem. Someone's banging their head and they typically would have been going to the ER. Or they do get sent to the ER and they get assessed behaviorally and we find out it's a dental issue. Um, if we find out it's a, that we think it's a dental abscess or whatnot, we can necessarily start them on antibiotic. But for actual dental care, we, you know, we, we, they, they need to be sent. And that's a real challenge. <laughs> that being said, we've have a few cases where we intervene. Um, you know, and the dentist will say, like, you know, I can't handle this. And and then, but we'll call them and say, hey, maybe they can come at the end of the day when your office is the last patient. Um, it won't be disruptive. So um, if that kind of helps. But yeah, it's a real big problem and it's a challenge. Uh, some of this population needs sedation for for their dental type procedures. But I will say that we have had many interventions where we don't, you know, this looks like an abscess. Don't send them to the ER. They're just going to put you on antibiotics and make you wait to go to a dentist anyway, instead of waiting for hours. Second, oftentimes we found dental issues um, presenting as a behavioral type issue, and then we intervene. So uh, that's kind of my two cents on that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you both. Just giving it again, another moment pause. I'm not seeing any further questions. Thank you both. It was wonderful information and what a perfect segue to move into Penn Dental Medicine's personalized care suite for persons with disabilities or P-Care. And we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Alicia Reisner Bowman, who is the Associate Director for Penn Care Center for Persons with Disabilities. Okay, well then I will try to keep this brief. As she said, I'm Dr. Alicia of the P-Care, as we like to call it, Center. Um, and I'll go through this quickly and then uh, hopefully, Get some questions at the end. 
So first, I have no financial disclosures uh, to disclose. We have to say that every time. Um, so we have um, multiple definitions, I'm sorry, of people with disabilities, as you know, who defines disabilities as any condition, any impairment that makes it difficult for somebody to do certain activities. So that could really include just about anybody at any time in our lifetime. We're all going to be quote unquote disabled. So I bring that up because that's something we mention a lot to our students, because how do you define where, you know, what is truly a disability? And, and when treating your patients, you know, the most important thing to remember is everybody's got a, a backstory, right? And so we're trying to make sure that um, the understanding is that, you know, it's not so much about the definition. It's not so much trying to figure out what the boxes are that the patient fits into, but really taking a look at what is it about the patient that you need to know? What needs do they have that you as a provider need to adapt to? And then how are you going to adapt to meet their needs? And so instead of us getting out of our box, let's talk about ways we're trying to teach people how to get into our patients' boxes, figure out what we need to do to help them. Um, be able to receive care more easily. So we all know there are lots of different types of needs and identifying the different needs uh, in our population, not only that there's a huge number of individuals with disabilities, but also understanding that there's a lot of oral disease out there, right? And we see a lot of extra oral disease in this population for a lot of different reasons. And many times it's because of um, their inability to care for themselves and someone else needs to provide that care and they may not be um, super cooperative with that because let's face it, if somebody is trying to provide you care but they're pulling on your lips and hurting you or they're brushing the wrong place and hitting you in the wrong places, you're not gonna necessarily be super cooperative to receive that oral care. So that can sometimes be one of the problems. Um, a lack of cooperation could be misinterpreted as simply refusing. And then once somebody refuses, whoever is trying to provide the care may walk away without truly finding out, you know, what is causing this refusal? Is it because you're hurting them? Is it because they're in pain? Um, you know, so there are a lot of different reasons. So we do know that many individuals with disabilities often have a disproportionate amount of disease. And we often see these different types of problems um, being reflected. They, uh, we can see dental decay that can be um, throughout the mouth or marginal. We can see occlusal wear, especially individuals who grind their teeth regularly. And we, I've seen instances where people grind their teeth right to the nerve chamber, which is the very center part of the tooth, but because the individual is nonverbal or unable to express um, that they're having pain, um, they may never um, indicate that they're having that type of pain where they have an exposed nerve that they're working around and nobody's aware of it until they finally have a dentist who actually identifies that. Or with the occlusal wear, we also get these very sharp edges that can cause all sorts of um, soft tissue trauma. We run into people missing teeth, and you can see that our example of the person with missing teeth also has a lot of buildup um, present on the teeth. And then, of course, periodontal disease, which is a complete breakdown of the soft and hard tissues um, that are associated with the teeth. So I often describe it as an open wound that is filled with calcified debris, bacteria, um, and bacteria that is eating away at the softest, soft and hard tissues, the bone itself, and destroying the bone and the soft tissues. And if you were to measure out the amount of space that that can be taking place on, two arches equals about the length of an arm from the wrist to the shoulder. So this is a pretty serious chronic um, disease process that can cause a lot of comorbidities associated with it. Um, what we find when we interview people regarding why, what are some of the fundamental barriers that they are facing accessing dental care, um, uh, patients and advocates 
and caregivers will tell us that when they call, they find that the dentist will report a lack of preparation or not being able to treat that person or those people. Unfortunately, that's still language we hear. Um, difficulties with communication, a lack of um, awareness on the part of the patients or caregivers regarding the need for dental treatment for the disabled person. And I bring that up because we have a lot of individuals in um, care homes that we find if they are tube fed, they don't take any oral intake, they then don't realize they still need to be cleaning the patient's mouth. And I've had parents come in and when they've seen the condition of the mouth, they don't realize they figured because they didn't eat food that there was no disease process occurring, but there still is a disease process occurring even when there is an oral intake. And then there's also the structural problems of um, accessing dental care that have been brought up in a few of the other um, presentations that you've had and you know, structural problems of simply getting into the office. And then of course, there's the other barriers of reimbursement, um, cost of care, reimbursement, the, the inability to be reimbursed adequately, keeping some individuals um, from seeing patients with disabilities. So there's a, 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 you know, we've been talking about the social determinants of health and how they affect this population long before it became kind of sexy now in the oral, in the medical communities and other communities, all of a sudden, you know, social determinants has become the big buzzword. And it's like, you know, those of us in dealing with individuals with disabilities, we've been talking about these determinants for 20, 30 years. Come on, we're, we've known about this. And now all of a sudden, everyone's finally paying attention to it. So hopefully that's going to increase um, access you know, to care and break down some of those barriers we've been facing right along. So one of the things is that um, happened recently was in 2019, CODA, the group that, you know, says what has to be taught or gives accreditation to dental schools, changed their requirements about what needed to be done and in the dental schools and what kind of information and what level of provider needed to be graduating and they made a very subtle change but because of this subtle change we're going to see a huge change in education because what it um, required that not only did they have to be able to assess the patient but they also had to be able to modify or manage the patient and when you added the word management that then took it from a being able to identify this person has a special need and I'm going to refer them to not only are you going to assess that they have special needs, but you must know how to manage that person appropriately. And it was a very subtle change, but what it did was it changed that schools needed to provide the ability for um, students to have more hands-on access so that they could graduate feeling that they have actually had more exposure and are comfortable and confident treating this population. Well, many schools aren't necessarily able to provide that education because of what has already been set up in their schools long-term or short-term. So that becomes a totally different uh, question. So with those changes, we already um, at Penn, we're in the process of, of teaching, teaching um, how to treat patients with disabilities, but we, increased that to be um, a larger effort on our part. And we developed a clinic with the cornerstone of an educational program designed to not only in, increase the amount of um, time that students spent in the clinic, but also how to best utilize the space to better accommodate patients. So our specialized care program, we focus on educating every graduate and they spend a good 10% of their senior year clinical time in our clinics. And we focus on teaching them how to treat patients without sedation and without general anesthesia. We're trying to break the tradition of, oh, the person has a disability, they need to go to general anesthesia or they need to be sedated. So we focus on preventing, reversing and arresting disease Instead of focusing, you know, not everything has to be treated to the most extreme. 
we do sometimes have incidents where we do need to refer somebody and then the plan is we're going to get them back and see them more frequently so we can focus on that disease prevention piece so they don't need to go to the OR again. Um, and most of the literature out there and the special programs we're providing are so that we can provide programs for students, dental educators, dentists, and for patients and caregivers. So we're trying to increase the literature and information that's out there. So not only is a specialized care suite for teaching practitioners or future practitioners, but it's also for providing a dental home for special needs patients. Obviously, we can't teach our students how to care for these individuals without having individuals for them to care for. So faculty oversees the students and we've been able to increase um, the number of patients that are being seen every year. We had a total patient pool of over 2000 patients as of April of last year. And of course that's only been growing. Um, so the main goal there was for us to be able to have a win-win for the patients, the caregivers and the students. We have a large team of individuals who are dedicated to treating this population. And the suite itself does have some special bells and whistles as far as having some wider corridors and wayfinding on the floors. We try to have this high volume air exchange to get rid of any strange smells. We do have nitrous oxide available and we have computers available everywhere. But essentially, even though we do have all these nice special features available in the different um, treatment rooms, we also try to teach our students that with very simple changes, it's easy to accommodate a patient or the various need, different um, special needs that our patients may prevent with, present with. As I said, our job is to adapt to their needs and try to figure out what we need to do to make those adaptations. So we do have um, the ability to filter light and acute, you know, deaden sound, privacy doors, that sort of thing. But even the most simplest things like having um, a little bit of extra room, showing our students how to be able to treat patients while they remain in the wheelchair, how to provide proper head support. Um, and we do also provide stabilization and teach our students how to provide stabilization. Because one of the things we've often said, many people will say, oh, they don't agree with stabilization. Stabilization is a safety measure. If somebody can't control their movements or has an inability to remain still, it's our responsibility to make sure that they stay safe during care. And many times it's as simple as holding a head still or keeping arms from reaching into the um, the treatment field. You don't want someone reaching up and grabbing sharp instruments that could cause them to be injured. So many times um, as we're teaching our students about stabilization and teaching caregivers and patients about stabilization, we always introduce, you know, the least restrictive methods that are possible. And in our um, philosophy, you know, sedation and anesthesia are much more restrictive modes of um, much more restrictive management techniques than stabilizing somebody physically, because those are things that are going to stay in their system are not reversible and can lead to post-operative complications um, when the person leaves. And as you said, many of our, uh, in the last presentation, many people are presenting to the ED or needing ED care because of falls. Go ahead and add sedation on top to somebody already has instability or gait problems or walking issues, and you're going to increase the fall, fall risk substantially. So, you know, it's not something to, to just um, say that everybody requires sedation or anesthesia to get their dental work done, unless we've tried other ways of providing care. And we've had many instances, and in my 30-year career, I had a lot of people that came and, you know, oh, they're, you're not going to get anything done. They have to be knocked out. And I just look at them and say, you watch and wait and see what this person can accomplish when we take the time to try to figure out what we need to do for them. Again, it's not for everybody, but it's better that we try and fail and then decide, okay, we need to send them on um, rather than not. Now, of course, if somebody presents to us with too much to be done and they can't really take the time for the desensitization, as I said, we will refer them for general anesthesia or sedation, and then we will get them back and continue with the preventive 
techniques and teaching proper preventive care and diet and all the things that help us create a healthier individual. Um, we have lots of ability for um, accommodating wheelchairs. We do have a lift to help with the chair. And it breaks my heart, the video that was earlier, you know, calling ahead and giving the information and then not everybody is able to do it. Um, and I'll um, I'll explain how that sometimes uh, can happen. And um, yes, it's very disappointing when you try to have all these wonderful things available and then somebody does a pre-interview and finds out something and then the information doesn't make it up the chain. Um, we also have consultation rooms and other things available. Sometimes we've even provided um, treatment in these rooms because it looks more like a living room or a dining room in somebody's home. And for that person who won't enter a dental operatory or a dental um, area that looks too dental e, so to speak, uh, sometimes we can get away with it. Uh, there's a lot you can accomplish without being in a dental office at all. Um, so we also use these consultation rooms for education and for immersion groups, which I will get into in just a moment. So our solution is to provide um, education through direct patient care. These are senior dental students. We also have junior students who assist. We have oral medicine residents who come through and do rotations. We have masters in oral health sciences and other programs. Um, those students come through, perio residents, endo residents. Essentially, um, we also have honor students in peak care, radiology, and oral medicine. So we do not just have our senior students rotating through, but we also have specialty students. And we now have prosthetic students um, rotating through as well. Our goal is to have these students as many students exposed to the population um, so that they can all feel comfortable with the treatment that we provide and they can feel that, you know, hey, I don't have to be afraid of this. I can do this just because they're moving doesn't mean I can't figure out a way to stabilize them and keep them safe and get the work done. We've also been reaching out to an international audience. We have international visiting scholars come through on a regular basis. Um, and we've also, you know, our biggest thing is providing the general care. And we provide general dental services. Um, we make comprehensive treatment plans utilizing forehanded dentistry. We first assess the oral risk and then we create a plan to address the oral risk and treat the existing disease and then prevent that, that disease from returning. Um, we also provide um, training for caregivers on how to provide proper care at home giving different examples of what it is we do in the office and sharing with them how they can then provide care at home. Um, more examples, we do do anesthesia, we do use stabilization, and by providing these um, safe, teaching them in our environment safe ways to provide stabilization encourages them to be more likely to provide that stabilization in the future in their own offices without um, finding problems. Um, feeling more comfortable. We also have a didactic um, portion where we're teaching our students um, how to care for individuals with special needs. And that didactic course is going to be a portion of a larger part. The didactic um, information, as you can see, covers a wide variety of information. So treatment planning, information about accessibility, how to treat um, patients, geriatrics, children with special needs, the implications of um, some of the um, disorders that we see, problems with providing proper oral care at home, teaching people how to provide that um, care at home. So there's a large amount of um, stuff being taught to the students, a lot of information, I shouldn't say stuff, but we're spending a lot of time trying to say that we've got a class of nearly 200 students every year coming through. And even if only 10% of them end up graduating and, and seeing our patients with disabilities, that's gonna put a huge dent into the current problems that we face with the lack of access to care. So we're gonna create confident com um, graduates who are confident in the services they're providing, comfortable with treating this population. And we, we are going to make sure that they're capable of providing that care in a safe and effective environment. Um, so we're hoping that that's gonna put a huge dent into the problem. Another thing that we do that's also a solution is we do um, look at telehealth. So 
what we do with Tutley Health is we try to get as much information, I'm sorry, about the patient as we can prior to them coming to their appointment so that we can be better prepared when they do arrive to be able to best meet their needs. And this is where that story about, you know, you call ahead and you give the information and still not being prepared. Yes, sometimes, unfortunately, that can happen. I don't know if that was at our school, but I'll tell you when it does happen, I'm infuriated as well as <laughs> the rest of our staff because, you know, unfortunately, we go through all of this to try to make it so that when the patient arrives, we can be ready. And then to have it not turn out that way is uh, really disappointing, not only for the patients, mostly for the patients, but also for us. Um, we also use our tele-dentistry to review oral techniques that maybe we taught in the office. We may call and say, hey, let's see you do it in the home environment and maybe make some changes to that technique. Um, we sometimes have had to teach nurses' aides and others um, how to provide care that we've taught to perhaps a caregiver, but they have aides that come into the home and they want us to teach the aides, but the aides can't come to our office. We then do that via telehealth. Um, we have a public health hygiene practitioner. Um, we can supervise fluoride varnish applications so the patient doesn't have to come back for a very simple procedure. And we also can review sometimes on an emergency call, take a look, see if we can identify whether they are going to need an antibiotic prior to coming um, to in order to move the care along a little bit. We also will then... Um, we also are teaching um, continuing education lectures that are available online. They're free, as they mentioned, and um, we've had, uh, I don't know what the numbers are currently, but we have had a huge um, interest in these uh, lectures that cover all sorts of different information. And this has been a way of trying to reach those practitioners already in the community saying, I don't know what to do. We also have an immersion program where people come from their offices and do two days hands-on learning along with some didactic learning. And we also direct them to the website for the continuing education program. So trying to reach those providers who have said, I don't feel comfortable because I don't have the experience. It, during the immersion program, it's like a little mini residency. It's a couple days. If they don't observe directly, we sometimes have cameras and observe in those consultation rooms what's happening so that the patient doesn't become overwhelmed with all these people watching. We can watch from a distance with the patient and um, guardian's per permission. Um, and the people that have been coming have been from mostly FQHCs. We've also had some offices um, interested in coming as well. Um, we've also created some videos for individuals um, to be able to watch before they come. Um, that cover a lot of different common procedures. And this was funded through a grant from the Eagles Aut um, Autism. So, and let's just see if we can get this to play. I'm not hearing any sound. Um, Okay, let me see. I, I'm not sure if it's mute in the video, but if not, you may need to reshare your presentation and click um, allow sound. I think that's the term it uses. Um, okay, let me try that. Uh... You share, ah, share sound. There you go. That, okay. Well. And then hit share again. And is it sharing the right screen again? It does not look like the screen has changed. Okay, good. Let's try that again. Dentists take x-ray pictures of your teeth. Yes. This allows us to see the hear. inside of your teeth to check for problems we cannot see just by looking in your mouth. This is the x-ray unit and it works like a camera. We line this up to your face and then we go quickly to push the button outside of the room to take the pictures. It is really important for us to get close to your teeth when we take these pictures so that we can see your teeth really well and make sure that we don't miss anything. 
so you can get the point. We used very simple language because we were trying to make these um, useful for a variety of ages, um, obviously children and adults. Um, and the students did the scripting and the videos. And Sabrina is kind of our, I like to call her our poster child. She works for us and she just absolutely loves being the patient in any videos that we do. So we always ask Sabrina to be our patient and she does a wonderful job. So um, we, we love having her in our clinic and she is so helpful with everything. She's the perfect model. Um, so anyways, this is another one, and these are website, these are available on our web website. And the, the beauty of it is an individual with autism, they can tell us what room they're going to be in. And we have videos that show what's present in each room so they can know what to expect. We have some very basic um, videos about when you have, what the different types of suction are, getting numb. So again, people can watch it over and over and over again and have sort of an idea, okay, this is what I should expect. This is what it's gonna look like. This is what it's gonna sound like. So a lot of that stuff, that um, sensory intake can be handled before the patient arrives. Um, so that was another solution that we came up with to try to help individuals um, receive care more easily. And that can be used any place because the we tried to use language that was not specific to our clinic only. Everybody uses a handpiece. Everybody uses a syringe. Everybody does radiographs. So we tried to make it very generic. Um, so here's a video where we kind of put it all together. Mom, again, was very concerned. Nobody would be able to take care of him. We did the tri telehealth information ahead of time. And basically, we needed to get permission to stabilize the patient. He's nonverbal, but he started responding with nods and other things, we found that a counting and breaking technique was all it took. We got it, so we said, we told him, we spoke directly to the patient, which again is something that very rarely happens with those individuals and nonverbal. Instead of talking to the patient, people talk to the people around them. We spoke to the patient directly and said, we need to hold your head still so that we don't hurt you. We're gonna use this, it's gonna sound like this. We're gonna to count to 10 and then we're gonna stop and give you a rest and allow you to, you know, reset, uh, take a little break. And the treatment was great. And uh, mom wanted a video, so we made a video. All right, he's opening right up for us. That's wonderful. Ready, Ready? Ready? two, And we did and the rewarding because mom six. said that he responded very Here positive to praise. Six. can see that, you know, it works out very well when you can find out what needs to be done and then make it happen for the person. Um, so that's our care center. These are the things that we are doing to uh, hopefully improve access to care for people by providing a new, um, a new way to take a look at dental care and trying to provide dental care um, in an environment that hopefully is user friendly. And the key thing is, you know, we're, we're trying to teach as many people as possible from all different walks, not just our students, but people already practicing in the community all over the world. We've had a response um, with learning how to provide this care. So that's where we are trying to adapt and come up with some different models. So please, whatever your questions are, I'd love to have them. Thank you, doctor. Yes, so we are opening up the floor to questions, hands, chat box, whatever works for you. Looking for those questions. And I would just like to say, as a parent myself, thank you so much. You, I, I just seeing how many different ways you're approaching this. I know when we think of the recommendations we made, you know, not just for access and plain language and structure and all types of disabilities, you know, and the training you're doing for other practitioners. It's, it's really exciting to hear. So thank you for your work. No, thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a big project. And um, it's the kind of thing that um, those of us involved, we've been involved with this for a very long time. Dean Wolf, this has been his, you know, 
poster, his brainchild, he's been wanting to be able to set something up like this that works this way in a clinic. And he got a hold of Dr. Robbins and myself, who've been doing this for a very long time. And a lot of you on the call, I see names that I recognize. Um, so, you know, it's been a passion of mine that the access to care issues just, just destroy me. And when someone says, oh, you know, we can't do it, they're too hard. I'm like, did you even try? You know, did you even talk to the patient? Did you try to figure out what's going on and why they're, you know, perhaps having a hard time with what's going on? You know, with the right, there's there's a safe way to do this for everybody. But yeah, it's not, not everybody can be treated without pharmacologic intervention. We get that. But the less pharmacologic intervention, the better in our, our world, because no one's ever died from being stabilized. But people have died from sedation and general anesthesia, and they've been greatly injured and hurt, you know. And it's interesting you brought up that you end up going to the ED more for falls than anything else. The number one reason that most patients with disabilities are hospitalized, from my understanding, it's still number one is uh, aspirations. And the risk of aspiration pneumonia is greatly increased when oral hygiene is not um, up to par. There's been a lot of research and evidence to show that the bacteria present in the aspirants in aspiration pneumonia are very often associated with the oral bacteria. So mm -hmm. it just shows where it's where it's coming from. So poor oral care when those um when that bacteria is allowed to build and build and have a great environment to live in, it increases the um danger of aspiration. Thank you for those details. I do see uh, one question coming up. How are patients referred to Penn Dental? Patients are referred to Penn Dental by simply calling and saying that you have a patient that you would like to be seen um, in the special needs, special care suite. There will be some basic questions that will then be asked, and then the call will be routed to the appropriate people to make the appointment. And we always make a televisit appointment and a clinical appointment because we want our students to do that pre-interview with the patient. So most offices, you're going to come in, you're going to fill out all the paperwork, or you're going to have the paperwork sent, you're going to fill it out, and you're going to take it with you. What we're trying to do is to avoid, um, avoid that by calling ahead, getting the medical history, the behavioral um, oral intake questions all we have a whole bunch of assessment questions that we ask that we have the students ask so they one become familiar with the patient and two they learn by asking all these questions wow i didn't know i had to think about all this stuff in treating this population right i didn't know i had to think about you know whether their diet is pureed or ground or whatever you know food is food well no it's not um you know that sort of thing so we have them do that and then we always make the initial appointment for about a week or two weeks afterwards, unless somebody's in pain, of course, because we then want the student, if there's any follow-up information needed, such as a consultation with a medical specialist, whether we need more information um, or we need to obtain consents from a guardian that may not be um, readily available, and we have to send the consent forms back and forth and fax and all that. And those of you who live in agencies know what that disaster is like. Um, and then we have the students review all the information with a faculty person, and we make sure that they have all the information they need, that they filled in all the blanks that they may need, and we go over a potential plan of action as to what management they may be putting in place just from the very beginning. The first visit goal may be simply if you can get a look in their mouth, even if you're able to just maybe get a toothbrush in there and get a quick look around and make sure there aren't any explosions going on. If that's all you accomplish on the first visit based on the information we've received, that's fine. That's a great good first visit. Then next visit, maybe you're gonna advance to maybe trying to get a mirror or whatever. And a lot of times the first visit is spent with hygiene instruction, trying to show better ways of accessing for the person who has to provide care, especially for that patient who isn't necessarily great just coming in and sitting and being in the dental office. Many times they need that first visit where nothing more happens than, okay, I'll let you look, but you're gonna look real quick and then you're gonna get out of here again. So um, we want them to do that telehealth visit, which will be scheduled first, and then the follow-up visit where they actually get started into the plan. 
uh, CODA amendment, significant training, history that led to that, ideas about how requirements. Um, I don't know how to send it to others, but CODA is the agency that um, certifies uh, schools. And uh, gosh, it was it wasn't until even I want to say it wasn't even I can't, I wish I knew the exact date where they even said that um, students had to graduate competent and at least um, being able to evaluate patients with special needs. I mean, that happened after I graduated in 93, although my school was providing that but it wasn't actually in the language. And then they added the language that students had to be able to treat these patients. And then um, with a lot of advocacy push and um, a lot of um, people like myself and others involved in education um, started making a push to see that changed from just being able to assess to being able to assess and manage. And that management piece then gave the implication that you're going to have to be able to do something. And um, it was really through a lot of people um, pushing the right buttons in the right places that we were able to get that to happen, just like the ground uh, grassroots efforts that you make all the time um, in all of your different organizations. I'm recognizing these names and I know everyone's been fighting so hard. So it was one of those situations where enough people made the call. And so now we're seeing a huge uptick in schools trying to change their special needs programs because currently our school is the only school providing program where the students get as much exposure as they do. Many schools have programs that are maybe a six week or eight weeks and maybe they're there one day a week for those six weeks so they've had maybe six encounters and that's it which is adequate enough to assess and and um but now that they've added the manage piece we're seeing an uptick in trying to provide more services and longer exposures and it's hard there's a lot of information for dental school i mean i look at what i had to learn and i look at what they have to learn now it's crazy. I don't know how they fit in anything. Um, but we actually have a huge amount of exposure because we have the space um, to do it. And, and uh, we hired the faculty to do it. Um, does Penn Dental plan to expand to other locations? Um, we currently are. We have a, a Cedar, which I believe is, and Woods. But Woods is, Woods is already an existing um, nursing facility where we're providing treatment. Cedar is a clinic that is, um, God, I want to say that's also already um, attached to a certain population. As far as expanding, I don't know that I can say that we're expanding, but I can say that we have our um, you know, special smiles bus that goes out to schools that handles mostly pediatrics. Um, but I do not know, you know, I don't see us popping up clinics in other places necessarily, but, you know, Dr. Wolf is a big, big dreamer with big vision. And this is our third class coming through this program. So to say that that might not be something in his, I can't speak for him, but he's the guy that if he says, you know, yeah, we're going to have, you know, some out clinic offsite or whatever that's going to start doing this, then, you know, he'll he'll make it happen. But for now, I think we just got this other clinic at Cedar open. Um, and that's probably going to be it for a while. But I can't I can't say I'll never say and I'll never put words in his mouth. So all of you who know him and I know most of you do um, <laughs> know that if we could expand, we probably would. But it's going to be a bit. I would, I would love it. I'd love to see us be able to provide, you know, other, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I'd love to see it happen, but. So I'll just jump back on Jamie's question. Is there any suggestions for um, those that don't have access to your organization on how to find people that can treat patients in this manner? Any suggestions? 
Um, my, you know, that, that's, that's, that's the problem, right? Everybody calls around and nobody wants to treat patients. We do have a patient navigator who has been trying to gather a referral base for other facilities. So if you call the school and ask to speak to the patient navigator for special care, we can probably get you connected to her and she is trying to provide um, some of that information. I don't know if we've provided any of that information on our website because we would probably have to have special permission or something due to the university blah blah. I say that meaning I don't understand all the university blah blah so I call it university blah blah. Everybody knows you know every place has their rules and I don't know all the rules. Um, but I think that's one way. The other way is to go to um, the um, the um, health and human services, people who are Medicaid providers very often, it will specify whether or not they're treating patients with special needs. Unfortunately, it's a lot of the calling around um, and finding out what you can. I do not have a specific list for Pennsylvania. Um, so yeah, I wish I had a better answer to that. I know the Pennsylvania Coalition for Oral Health has a lot of information from all over the state. And I know that they've been gathering, um, trying to gather uh, that type of information, not just for people treating patients with disabilities, but just treating um, who takes Medicaid in general. But I think starting with a Medicaid provider list and then calling those because almost all of the patients with um, disabilities are going to have Medicaid as at least one of their insurances. Um, so that would be a place to start. But unfortunately, I wish I had a better answer. That's just been a, a problem. Thank you. I think that is extremely helpful. Let me just give it another moment to see if we have any final questions. Again, drop in the chat, go off mute, raise your hand. Right, it looks like we're good for questions. Again, both our presenters, sure. thank you so much. I I'm going to invite time? Emma. Terrific, and I'm going to invite mm. Emma back to give us some next steps and share some more information. Thank you so much um, for presenting and for taking all those questions and everybody for, for, um, for giving those questions and really listening during this hour and a half. Um, we have one more Lunch and Learn in our series happening next Tuesday, a week from today, the same time, 12 to 1.30, about a disability inclusive healthcare system. We have Wood Services presenting next week to really dive deep into what they've been doing. Um, so the signups are still available for that if you would like to join us. And then I also want to plug two summits that are happening next year, um, the 2024 Disability Health Action Summit that the Arc of Pennsylvania is hosting is happening on March 6th, 2024, up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, we have some really amazing panelists, presenters, breakout rooms, and discussions that are going to be going on. Um, registration is opening up at the start of the new year. So we have our save the date up on the website, um, but we're really looking forward to having that. Um, and then last thing to plug is the Department of Health Office of Health Equity Summit. Theirs is um, happening on April 4th and 5th of 2024, also up in Harrisburg. And I know that they have a um, breakout room designation this year, all about disability health equity, um, which should be really interesting and exciting to hear about all of their news. Um, so again, thank you guys so much for joining us today and um, being with us for this hour and a half. And we hope to see you all next Tuesday